running. Good. Okay. Hi. So I want to start um, and talk about a couple of things that I noticed when I was uh, grading your guys' tests. So it isn't targeted at anybody in particular, but I saw a couple of what I would call like algebra one kind of mistakes that I want to take a few minutes and just kind of rehash a little bit. Um, because this was something that, I don't know, like a third or more of students were kind of making mistakes similar to these, and I just want feel like it's probably a good idea to go back and kind of point out what the mistake is and how we deal with these things. Um, so, you know, just trying to get better, right? And we have still a few people that are waiting to take their tests, so rather than waiting for them to come back, I figure let's just talk about some of these mistakes now without actually going through the test. Is that okay with you guys? Okay. Um, so we'll just call this like review or whatever. And again, this isn't anything necessarily you would need to write down or take notes on. You're welcome to do so if you want, but if you just sit and listen, that's fine too. Um, so on the test or whatever, we'd have... <coughs> I don't know, something that might look like this, right? This looks like a familiar kind of problem that we would have seen. So one of the things that I saw um, on kind of a regular basis is when people were trying to remove this negative 3, I saw a lot of students attempting to add this to both sides. That's not the correct step to do there. Why is adding three to both sides not going to cancel this out? Yeah, the operation going on between the app's value and the negative three is multiplication. So adding three to both sides isn't going to remove that. That was fairly common. I saw lots of students make that mistake here and there. And inconsistently even, like I saw some students making it sometimes and then not other times, which again, I get it. It's been a little bit since Algebra 1, but we need to clean that kind of skill up pretty quickly. Is everybody okay with that idea? And we're good with it. That needs to be divided. Um, but really, that shouldn't be the first thing we do in general. Now, if you were thinking you could undo that with addition or subtraction, it's not unreasonable for that to be the first thing you do. Um, but in this problem, really, we should do the subtraction first on the 10. And then we can divide the negative 3. Now, when we divide things to both sides and add things to both sides, maybe I'll take this back up for a second. Now, when we add things or subtract things to both sides, we usually just write it underneath and do it to one place and we can cross it out, right? What we're really doing, though, is we're adding or subtracting to the entire thing. So we're adding or subtracting to the entire side. Now, addition and subtraction isn't distributive. So those set of parentheses don't really need to be there. So the way we write it like this is perfectly fine. Is everybody okay with that idea? However, on the next step, we need to be quite careful about when we divide to both sides. So I saw lots of students in this setting do something like this. This is not correct. Now, dividing by negative 3 is what we want to do. But the issue is when we divide by negative 3, we need to think about doing that to the end. Oops, there's no plus 10 left. Uh, doing this to the entire side. So when we divide by negative 3 here, 
really what we mean is the entire thing is divided by 3. And this entire piece is divided by negative 3. So we can't just divide the negative 3 to specific pieces. It's got to be to the entire side or not at all. Now, because this is multiplication, the negative 3s can just cancel and I can leave the x plus 1 alone. On the other side, though, I cannot do that because I don't have multiplication going on between the two things, right? The two things on the right-hand side are being subtracted. So really what I need to do is I need to write this as this. So that negative 3 needs to be a denominator to both pieces. And this was a mistake I saw quite frequently. There was one of the solving problems on the first page where you had to do this. And I think a lot of us, maybe more than half, even made this mistake. And it's easy to make, right? Especially if we haven't, we've been away from algebra for a little while. It's easy to kind of, those things will drift on us a little bit. But it's an important concept to kind of get straightened out here early before we get too much further into solving that we have to be really careful when we're doing things to both sides that the operation we're doing matters a lot in terms of how we do it to both sides when we add or subtract to both sides you can do it to individual locations i can add five to one place on the right side and one place on the left side that's fine as long as it's not inside a parenthesis or something but when we multiply or divide to both sides, it's got to be to the entire side. So every term on the entire side. So over here, we really just have one term because we have two things that are multiplied together. I'm thinking about this as one, term, as one thing and the negative 3 is one thing. And we just have two things that are multiplied together, which is really just one term from an algebraic standpoint. On this side, though, we distinctly have two separate terms because we have two things that are being subtracted. There's nothing being multiplied to that also. That's two separate terms. So when we divide both sides by negative 3, each term needs to get divided by negative 3. Does that feel better, like help clarify some of this? I know some people asked about it on the answer key. I think there's a problem where I divided both sides by negative 3, and then I started getting fractions all of a sudden. A couple of people came and asked me about that. This is what's going, that was what was going on. Um, does that feel a bit better? Okay. Um, in the future, again, as we're doing solving things, if you have a question about, like, hey, why did you do that only to one place, or how were you, you know, like, why were you able to do that, stop me and ask. I'm happy to take some time and review some of these concepts. They're important things to review, right? Because these little kind of fundamental things show up again and again and again over and over and over again. And it makes it really difficult to get the correct answers on something more complicated if we're making mistakes on these kind of processes. And it's okay to make mistakes on them. I want to, I want to be clear, like, this is part of learning, right? We wouldn't be in school if we knew how to do it already. So we're just you know, just trying to do a little bit better. You know what I mean? Okay. So that, that, those were the two big things that I saw um, that I would consider like prior skills that needed to kind of be touched up on a little bit. Um, we may go and do a, another, like another review assignment on solving here in a day or two to just kind of brush up on these skills again, just to make sure that we, we've got it. Um, but I don't have that ready for us right now, so. Is that okay? Okay. Today, uh, we're gonna start chapter three.
and chapter three is about systems of linear equations. So let's pick that phrase apart a little bit to kind of ex describe what it is that we mean here. So when we say linear equation, So when we say a linear equation, we mean that the variables in that equation have the exponent 1. That so you don't have anything squared or anything to the third or any square roots or anything else in it. So for example, we could have something like 3x plus y is equal to 2. That's an example of a linear equation. Because if I look at the variables involved, x and y, both of them are exponents or have exponent 1. We know that we don't, if the exponent is 1 on a variable, we never really write it down. We just understand it to be there. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. A system. When we talk about a system of equations, we're talking about a group of equations that must be satisfied simultaneously. And we know what simultaneous means. That means at the same time. So let's give an example of a system of equations. Well, we should say system of linear equations. So when we write a system of equations, typically we put one half of a curly bracket to indicate to you that instead of just a list of separate equations, this is a group of equations that need to be thought of as a system that we need to be taking into account all at the same time. And then we'll just list our equations. Everybody okay with that? So when we talk about a solution to a system, we talk about a value for, you checked in at the office? Yeah. Okay. We talk about a value for each of the variables that makes both equations true. So for example, 1, 1 is not a solution. Let's does or let's let's show show you why one one is not a solution. So again, when I write it one one, I'm talking about a value for x and a value for y. If I plug one one into the first equation, well, two times one plus three times one is five. However, if I plug 1 into the second equation, 1 plus 2 times 1 is not 1. 
Everybody okay with that? So, however, the point 7, negative 3 is a solution. Let's demonstrate why. So when I plug 7 and negative 3 in for x and y respectively, I get 14 minus 9, which is 5. And when I plug 7 and negative 3 into x and y respectively, I get 7 minus 6, which is also 1. So that that is a solution because both equations in my system are satisfied. Do we feel okay about what we mean by a solution to a system? We haven't talked at all about how we find these solutions. So if that's what you're wondering about, that's what's coming next how we actually do this solving process. But right now we just wanted to talk about what it means to be a solution. Okay? So today we're going to talk about three different methods we can use to solve a system. The first method we're going to talk about is graphing. So Let's use that same system that we just looked at. And show you how to do this by graphing. So as a, before we start this, or what, let's say, before we start this, let's kind of describe what we're about to do. So, we're going to graph each one of these two equations on the x-y axis. And then if we're looking for an x and a y that are true in both equations, we're looking for a point that lies on both equations at the same time. So what we're looking for is the intersection of the two graphs. Is everybody okay with that idea? Okay. So as an aside, what will the shape of these two graphs look like? This should be something that you can look at and recognize immediately what kind of graph you're going to be looking at or what the general shape is going to be. Okay, that's fine. We're not ready to do that yet. So what if we, when we graph things, typically it starts y equals, right? Well, let's rearrange these so that they look like what we'd expect, where they start y equals. Does that sound okay? So for the first one, we'll subtract 2x from both sides. And then we'll divide both sides by 3. Now remember, when we're dividing by 3, we have to divide both parts of the right-hand side by 3. So we're going to get negative 2 thirds x plus 5 thirds. Now we have something we absolutely should recognize. What shape of graph does y equals negative 2 thirds x plus 5 thirds make? 
You should recognize that form of an equation. That slope-intercept form, which means that the shape is going to be like a line, right? Just going to be a straight line. Everybody okay with that? Everybody's good? And we'll do the same thing over here with the other one. So we'll subtract the x over, and then we'll divide by 2. And again, what we're left with is a line, right? Okay. So how many points do we need to graph a line? Two, right? You should remember from geometry, that was one of our axioms. Through any two points, you can create a line. So for the first equation, we're going to just pick some values for x and then find a corresponding value for y. Everybody good with that plan? So here I'd want to be a little bit careful because I don't want to end up with a bunch of crummy fractions. I prefer to have whole numbers here. Um, so I notice right away that if I pick x to be 1, negative 2 thirds plus 5 thirds gives me 3 thirds, which is just 1. And then my next goal would be to either get like a six thirds or a nine thirds, try to get something like that, so that again it'll reduce down to be a whole number. I don't see a good way to get six thirds, but I do see a good way to get nine thirds. If I pick x to be negative two, that's going to give me four thirds plus five thirds, which is nine thirds. Or three. Now it doesn't really matter whether we find a whole number or not, but it just makes the graphing a little bit easier if we have whole number x's and y's. If you had found a decimal, that's okay. And it would be okay to represent it as a decimal rather than a fraction since we're going to graph. Graphing a fraction, you know, like where is five thirds at? Well, I don't, I mean, make it into a decimal and then, you know, 1.6 repeating is a better easier to deal with than a fraction when you're graphing. When you're solving, you should keep the fraction, but when we're graphing, a decimal is perfectly appropriate. Okay, uh, let's look at the other one now. So again, I notice that if I pick x to be one, I get negative one half plus one half, so that's zero. That's good. That's a whole. That's a whole number pair. And then if I pick x to be any odd number, I'll end up when I add the half, I'll end up with a whole number result. So maybe I'll just pick x to be positive three. So negative one half times three is negative three over two. Negative three over two plus a half is negative two over two, which is just reduces down to negative one. So now we have enough to graph. So we'll draw an x, y axis. So I'm going to graph this first one in blue and the second one in green. So I have the point 1, 1, and then negative 2, positive 3. And then the other one I have 1, 0. 
and then 3, negative 1. And it looks like my intersection then is happening out here. Everybody okay with that? Yeah, exactly. So that intersection appears to be at x equals 7 and y equals negative 3. Now what's the drawback to this method of doing it by hand here? There's a couple of obvious drawbacks. When you say it might not be as accurate, what do you mean? Like, you're drawing your lines so you might not be able to see it when it's Wonderful. Yes, yeah, so suppose that the answer we are looking for is like 1.57 comma 2.3. Are you going to be able to draw an accurate enough graph, even if you use graph paper and rulers and like tried to make this as good as you possibly could. Are you going to be able to draw an accurate enough graph to find that intersection? Probably not, right? Even if we're just looking for a whole number solution, like in this case, probably if some of us tried to draw this graph, we'd still have been too messy to actually come up with 7, negative 3. If we added graph paper, I would hope at that point in a ruler you could have found it. But... That's a real concern, right? So this by hand graphing method is a little bit concerning because of the accuracy involved. It's also fairly time consuming. It took us quite a bit, you know, quite a bit of work to get to that picture. Is there a method or is a tool we can use to make this a little bit more precise? Yeah, yeah. what do you think? The calculator can do this for us. Yeah, so let's take out our graph and calculator and kind of give that a shot. If you have your calculator with you, I invite you to take it out and follow along. If you don't, that's okay. You can just sit and watch, but somebody should probably grab the light because I'm guessing you can't see very well the screen on my calculator with the overhead lights on. Thanks, Joe. That's probably a lot better, right? Okay. So if we want to graph something on our calculator, where do we need to go? The Y equals menu. Very good. So we'll press that in the upper left-hand corner. And you'll notice that I've already typed in the two equations. So I did in Y1, I did the first equation. And in Y2, I did our second equation. You'll notice that the Ys are already built into the calculator for us, so we don't need to type those in. Remember the shortcut to get the fraction was alpha and the Y equals button. So if you press alpha and then y equals, it'll and then pick that first option. It'll put the fraction and fraction bar in there that you can fill in. That helps make things a little bit neater. Although you can still do it with just division. You can just do one over two, like one divided by two times x plus five divided by three. And the calculator knows the difference or knows what it's what you're doing. So take a minute, let you guys type those in, and we'll talk about what to do next.
Okay? So the next thing we need to do is we need the calculator to generate the graph for this. And when we generate the graph, we need to see enough to be able to see where, they, where the intersection is. If the calculator, if you can't see the intersection on your screen, the calculator won't be able to find the intersection for us. So when we graph this, that's what we need to make sure that we're checking for before we move on to try to find that intersection, is that we can actually see it on the screen. So the easiest way for us to graph is we're going to press the zoom button there in the middle of the home row, and we're going to pick option six that says zoom stand or Z standard. So here comes the first equation, and here comes the second one. And I can see the intersection on the screen. It looks like it's happening somewhere over there, right about there. Is everybody okay with that? Joe? So the calculator is going to find the xy point sure. for us in just a second. So here's what I would say. Yeah, I, I would say that you should be able to do that, okay. but I would not ask you to do it a lot because it is rather time consuming. But it's an Algebra 1 skill yeah. that we should still kind of have. Okay. Um, but it is time consuming and kind of difficult sometimes to be super accurate with it. But we should be able to do it. I don't know that I would ask you to do it more than one time on a, an assessment or something. Okay. Um, does that sound reasonable? Again, fair question. I haven't written the test yet, so I don't, I don't want to say whether I will ask you to do it or not. But it's something, it's a, it's a reasonable skill to ask. Um, the nice part about having this is that you'll know what the answer is supposed to be when you do the graph, so it should be much easier to get the correct answers to fall out of it. Okay, so we have our picture. We can see the intersection on the screen, right? Now, let's take for a moment, talk as a hypothetical. What if we couldn't have seen the intersection? What if it looked like they were getting close towards the end of the screen, but they went off the screen without crossing? And let's say it's the bottom right-hand corner where it looked like they were starting to get closer, but we couldn't see them. What we'd want to do is we'd want to go and adjust our window. So if we need to see further to the right and potentially further down, looking at our window, we'd want to change the X max. So that's the biggest x-coordinate on our number line. So we'd make that a bigger number, like 20 or something. And if we want to also see further down, we need to change our y minimum, maybe change that to negative 20 from negative 10. But that's how we can kind of change our window. If you can't see the intersection when you do the zoom standard, we'll go to our window. And if we need to see further to the right, we change the x max to a bigger number. Or if we need to see further to the left, we change the y, or the x max to a smaller number, say like negative 20. And then the same thing with up and down, except now you're talking about the y max alignment. Is that okay, guys? But we didn't need to do that here. Come on in. Um, I just wanted to kind of talk about how you would do that if you got a situation where they did, you couldn't see them. Thank you. Okay, so let's have the calculator find this intersection. So to do that, we're going to press second and then the trace button. This is the same menu we went to to find the maxes and mins, right? From this list of commands, which one sounds like the one we're going to be looking for? Or the one we want to use? Yeah, intersect, right? We're looking for the intersection of these two. Intersect sure sounds like it. That is the one that we want to use. So let's select the intersect command, or you can go down to it and press enter. You can just press the number five. Now the calculator is going to ask us three questions. There at the bottom of the screen, it says first curve. And you'll see that a, our cursor has popped up on the screen. So you can see my cursor is like right there. 
and it is on one of the two lines that I want to find the intersection of, right? So anywhere on that line, I can just press enter. It doesn't matter where. And you'll notice as soon as I do that, it's now toggled my cursor to the next line. Well, I only have two lines that I'm graphing. I want to find the intersection of these two lines. It's already moved me to the next one. Anywhere on this next line is fine. So just press enter anywhere. And then it asks for a guess. Does the guess really matter? No, you can guess anywhere, it'll be fine. So let's just press enter right where we're at. And a you know, few, few fractions of a second later, it spits out the intersection there, the coordinate seven negative three. That's pretty nice, right? And no matter how crummy of a decimal that intersection is, the calculator will find it, you know, up to like seven or eight decimal places, which is probably all you'd ever need from a practical standpoint. What do you guys think? We okay with this process? Should be fairly easy, right? You're just typing something into the graph. We've done that before. And then you're using this intersect command that's in the same place as the max and min command. And the prompts are quite similar to the max and min and max commands, or min and max prompts. So it shouldn't be too bad. Do you guys feel okay doing this? Okay. Um, so this is a lovely pro or a lovely technique. The really the best part of this is that even if the form of the equation is something that we're not familiar with, if we can get the y by itself, we can just type it into the calculator, and the calculator can handle the intersection for us, right? It takes very little like algebraic knowledge to deal with this, right? What's going to be the drawback even though provided that we have a calculator to use to do this? What happens if we have three variables? If we have an x, a y, and a z variable? Can we graph that? Well, you can. The graph is going to be three-dimensional now. So, like, there's a way to kind of do that on a sheet of paper, but the calculator can't handle that. This calculator can't, at least. Um, what if there was four variables, though? That there's not even a graph for, because the world is only three-dimensional, at least the way that we perceive it. And you certainly can't draw a four-dimensional graph. So this method has all of a sudden run into a lot of limitation here, right? It's really effective if we have two variables, but past that it gets to be problematic. So let's outline a couple of other methods that we can use that are not reliant on graphing and as a result scale very nicely to having more than two variables involved. Okay with that plan? So these next two methods are things that you might have seen in your Algebra 1 class. So the first one is called substitution. So let's take a look at this same system that we've been using. I'm using the same system over and over because we know what the answer is. So we know that we've done things correctly when we're finished. So the idea for substitution is I'm going to pick one of the two equations and I'm going to pick one of the variables from, those, from that equation and rearrange the equation so that one variable is by itself. So if I'm looking at this situation, I'm going to name these equations equation A and equation B, just so it's a little bit easier to talk about. 
It doesn't matter which equation you pick, and it doesn't matter which variable from that equation you choose to isolate, but you can make your life easier by choosing well. So in this situation, which would be the easiest choice? Use equation B, and which variable would you want to isolate? To get by itself. I would pick the x. Why would, why would getting the x from equation B by itself be the easiest thing? All the other options, I'd have to divide the coefficient on the y off, right? In all those other options, dividing by that coefficient on the y is going to create fractions. Basically, my hope here is I'm going to try to pick the equation and the variable so that I can avoid having fractions. Is it a problem if I get fractions? No. But if I don't have to deal with them, it makes my life just a little bit easier. So why not just do that? Is everybody okay with that idea? So to get the x by itself in equation b, I'll just subtract 2y from both sides. Which now gives me x equals 1 minus 2y. Is everybody okay there? Okay, now that I know that x is equal to 1 minus 2y, I can use that to substitute it for the x into the other equation. So where I had my x in equation A, I'm going to replace that with 1 minus 2y. Is everybody okay there? Now what you'll notice is I've, I, I have an equation with just one kind of variable in it. This equation has only y's. This I can solve for directly. So I'll distribute my 2 through. Oops. That wrong. And I'll combine my like terms. So negative 4y plus 3y is just negative y. And then if I subtract 2 from both sides, I get negative y is equal to 3. And if I divide by negative 1, I get that y is equal to negative 3. Is everybody okay with that idea? And that's one of my answers, right? Or one part of my answer. How am I going to find x? I know what y is. How am I going to find x? Yes, yes. So I can take this answer, that y is negative 3, and I can plug it in for y into any of these three spots. I think this spot will actually be the easiest to plug it into because the x is already by itself, right? It'll be super easy to solve for. So negative 2 times negative 3 is positive 6. So if I take those two answers together, there's my solution, 7, negative 3.
Are we okay with that? Not too bad, right? Does anybody remember doing that before in their Ultra 1 class? I think it's not uncommon that you do a solving some systems in Ultra 1, these little two variable systems that we're starting with. So if this looks familiar, it probably is. Uh, the third situation, or the third method, is elimination. So again, I'm going to solve this same system we've been using as our example. So the idea with elimination is that I'm going to multiply one or both of my equations by some constant, like a number. And the number could be different if I'm multiplying both equations. So that when I add the two equations together, one of the variables will cancel out. So for example... I'm going to call this equation A and equation B. Let's say I wanted to eliminate the x's. To do that, I can multiply equation B by negative 2, because 2x plus negative 2x will give me 0. Is everybody okay with that? If I instead had chosen to eliminate the y's first, what would I do to do that? Well, we have to do we have to multiply is how we're gonna is what we have to do to make that work. So let's multiply or let's look at two and three. What number does both two and three go into? What's any number that both two and three go into? Six. So let's try to turn the, both of those, or turn one of them into six and the other into negative six. Okay with that plan? So I could multiply equation A by positive two. That'll give me six Y. And multiply equation B by negative three. That'll give me negative six Y. So that when I add them together, the Y's will cancel out. Either of those two approaches is fine. It does not matter. Let's choose to do the first one. So let's choose to eliminate the x's. To do that, we're going to take equation A and add it to negative 2 times equation B. So that's the way that I do my notation to describe like what it is that I'm doing in the step. That's not standard, that's just something that I've made up. Um, but it's important that you guys understand what that notation means. Are you guys good with that? Okay. So equation A, nothing different happened to, so I'm just gonna recopy that. And equation B, I'm multiplying by negative two. So negative 2 times x is negative 2x. Negative 2 times 2y is negative 4y. And negative 2 times 1 is negative 2. So I multiplied each of the coefficients by negative 2. Is everybody okay with that? And then I'm just going to add down. So negative 2x plus 2x is 0. 3y plus negative 4y is negative y. And 5 plus negative 2 is, po is positive 3. So now to solve for y, I just divide both sides by negative 1. And there's my answer for y. Are we okay with that so far? 
So that's half our answer, right? How are we going to find x? To plug the y back in to either equation and solve for x. So I'm going to plug it back into equation b. Yes, sir. So putting them together, then I have my solution seven, negative three. How does that feel? Should be okay, right? That's not too bad. The hardest part is getting a hang of what do I need to multiply the one, one or both equations by so I can cancel the variable that I'm trying to cancel. But once you've gotten the hang of that, it's not, that's not too difficult to do. And I think the algebra afterwards gets really easy, right? If you look at the things after you've added the two equations together you had to do to get your answer, all that stuff was quite easy solving. All right, so here's the biggest, the big question. So is there always a solution? Well, let's think about this geometrically, right? We said the idea of solving this two-variable system was the same as finding the intersection between the two lines, right? Okay. Do two lines always intersect? No. When would they not? When they're parallel, right? Parallel lines never intersect. So we know right away then, no, there's not always going to be a solution because what if the two lines were parallel? Do we remember when we, how we can tell if two lines are parallel? This is reaching back to geometry, but you probably also talked about this in your Algebra 1 class. It has to do with slopes. No? Okay. Parallel lines have the same slope, and they have different y-intercepts. So if we have the system y equals 3x plus 5 and y equals 3x plus 4, this has no solution. Is everybody okay with that? So one way you could check is just by rearranging your lines so that they're in slope-intercept form and it's easy to kind of see if the slopes are the same but the y-intercepts are different. What about This system, this system also has no solution. 
Is there a way that, um, oops. Oops, 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 oops. Um, this system also has no solution. Is there a way I can tell this has no solution without having to rewrite these equations in slope-intercept form and without having to try to solve it? There is. So what I'm going to look at here is I'm going to look at the left-hand side. So I noticed that the left-hand side of A, LHS is just an abbreviation for the left-hand side, is equal to negative 2 times the left-hand side of B. Right? If I take equation B and multiply it by negative 2, the left-hand side of B and A would be the same then, right? Can we see that? But the right-hand side of A is not equal to negative 2 times the right-hand side of B. Because I would get negative 8, and that's not the same as negative 10. Megan? That's just the letter S. It's LHS for left-hand side. It's just an abbreviation. You're talking about this letter here? That's okay. Yep, it's just the letter S. Just me abbreviating. So again, on a homework assignment or a test or a quiz, you could certainly make that observation, and you don't have to do any solving. And you could be done right there and just say no solution. How many of us think that on a test or quiz setting we'd be under a, a little enough stress that we would even think to look for that before just instead of just starting one of the solving processes? It's probably you would just dive into trying to solve this, right? It's easy to forget to do that. So graphically, we know what this is going to look like. Right? Parallel lines, we know what they look like. What is going to happen if I try to solve this system by substitution or elimination? So let's say we try to sub do this by substitution. And let's say we tried to get the x by itself in equation b. Rewrite it, I guess. So we would or add two y to both sides, and then divide by negative one. Right. And then if I substitute that back into equation A, and if we combine like terms, negative 4y and positive 4y cancel each other out. We're left with negative 8 is equal to negative 10. That's false. If you're left with a false statement, like negative 8 is equal to negative 10, that just means no solution. Similar thing would happen with elimination things would cancel out and you'll be left with like 0 equals 2 or something. And I'm not really sure what that bell is for because we still have 15 minutes of class. So we're going to just keep going. Is everybody okay with this? So nothing, 
nothing was different. Just you get a weird result along the way, and that's all that weird result is going to mean. The elimination, you do the exact same thing as we did before, but you'll end up with like a weird result after you do your elimination. You'll get like 0 equals 5 or something, you know. Um, Jacob. Yes, sir. Okay. Um, the last question I have. is can we get more than one solution? What do you think? Probably the easiest thing to do is to try to go back to geometry. Can two lines intersect more than once? We have to be very careful here. I left a word out of that phrase that would have been there in geometry that I didn't include here. If I had said, can two distinct lines intersect more than once, the answer there is definitely no. But I've left off the word distinct. If the lines are not distinct, can they intersect more than once? Yes. How many times would they intersect? If the lines are indistinct, it means they're really just the same line. So they intersect at every point on the line. How many points are on the line? Infinitely many, right? So the answer here is yes. Those lines that are indistinct we call coinciding. So coinciding lines are really the same line. They should have the same slope and the same y-intercept. Well, that's going to be easy to see if we uh, rewrite them in slope-intercept form. You would just end up with like something that looks like this. So I use the abbreviation IMS for infinitely many solutions. But what if they were written, say, in this form? Notice here that if I multiply equation A by negative 3, the x's would be the same, and the y's would be the same, and the constant would be the same, right? So what we really have here is that negative 3 times equation A is equal to equation B. That's enough to say there's infinitely many solutions if you make that observation. But again, under a stressful situation like a test or whatever, you might not think to even check that before you start solving. You probably will just end up diving straight into solving, right? What's going to happen if we try to do that? Well, let's do this one with elimination. And let's just say we chose to eliminate the x's. So we did negative 3 times equation A, I'm sorry, uh, 3 times equation A plus equation B. 
So 3 times a is 9x minus 6y equals 30. And equation b is negative 9x plus 6y equals negative 30. If we add down, we're left with 0 equals 0. This is a true statement. That tells us there's infinitely many solutions. So if all the variables disappear, you're, it's either no solution or infinitely many solutions. If you get two things that are actually equal, like 2 equals 2 or 0 equals 0 or negative 10 equals negative 10, that's infinitely many solutions. If you get two things that are not equal, like 1 equals 2 or 0 equals negative 6, that's no solution. And we're done for today. Okay? Um, so we'll stop this. I will put an assignment here in the content library.